trick or treating, watching scary movies, intentionally scary movies, drinking. Me? Well, my own hubris has led to this. Had I known I would have had to review this, uh, well, I probably still would have reviewed this, but it would have been nice to know. So according to one source, Kimberly J. Brown was originally supposed to play Marnie in this movie, but due to scheduling conflicts, she wasn't available. She was filming Big Bad Wolf, a movie that I'd much rather be watching right now. However, an interview with Kimberly says that she was actually available for shooting the film, but Disney chose to recast the character of Marnie. This was a huge mistake! Why would you recast this character? Especially since literally every other character isn't! It was such a weird choice. Well, maybe the actress they got was so perfect for their vision of Marnie that they decided to use her. <laughs> no, we got Sarah Paxton. It's not that I hate her or that she isn't a good actress, it's just I don't think she fits the role at all. It doesn't help that we had Kimberly J. Brown be the character for three movies before, but I'll try to keep an open mind about this. Ugh, try being the operative word here. So, to conclude Halloween Town Month, let's dive into Return to Halloween Town. Cromwell of great power will embrace the gift. Oh no, it's a chosen one story. Here we go. Marnie Piper is a Cromwell of the prophecy, the one we have waited for. Hey, it could have also been Neville Longbottom. Oh, that was it? Okay. Hmm, Halloween Town Church is really quick. Marnie is going through her clothes as she prepares for college. In two minutes, we discover several things. One, Marnie is apparently using magic for stuff she really shouldn't need to. Two, she's much more fashion conscious now. Yeah, because that was such an important character trait in the earlier movies. Oh, wait a minute! Did I buy that dress? I bought that. Oh, love it. And three, Sarah Paxton is making Marnie come across as much more obnoxious than before. Aggie calls Gwen to let the audience know that she and Sophie aren't going to show up in the rest of the movie. And more importantly, congratulates Marnie. Gwen doesn't know what she's talking about, and Marnie tells her that she's been accepted to college in Halloween Town. To which university? Well, you're not gonna spend it with a bunch of witches, either. What's wrong with being a witch? I'm a witch, you're a witch, I just want college to be different, like you said. Gwen is back to square one again, insisting Marnie goes to college in the human world. She's mostly just concerned about how much magic Marnie uses. All that power comes responsibility, Marnie. Hey, wait! You stole that from- You stole that from Spider-Man. Oh. The movie made the joke for me. Time movie. Gwen tells her she won't pay for it, but it's okay. Apparently, Marnie got a free scholarship. Help me, Marnie Wan Kenobi. You're our only hope. And by hope, I mean chosen one. On behalf of the entire faculty, I want to extend to you a full scholarship. We would be proud to have a Cromwell at Witch University. Marnie is accompanied by Dylan to Halloween Town, where Benny serves as their ride to Witch University. Sister, to me, everyone's a kid. <laughs> Oh man, what did you do to Benny? He looks so terrible here! How is it that he looked so much better in the first movie? They did a nice job of mixing the practical and CG effects to make him look really cool, but here? He just kind of looks like a terrible Halloween decoration. Also, his accent's changed? What the hell? Marnie is welcomed by Chancellor Goodwin, the head of the university. A gargoyle alerts the guy from the beginning, whose name is Silas Sinister, that Marnie is there. Well, clearly he was in Slytherin House. Also, guys, he's totally evil. I'm really sure about it. After using magic to try and carry her things, Marnie discovers, quite rudely, that magic is not allowed on campus. She is greeted by three bitchy sisters called the Sinister Sisters, as well as some rude guy who probably won't be seen again. Dylan really likes one of them because she speaks Latin. Such a turn on. Dylan informs us that he's enrolled here to keep an eye on Marnie for Gwen. So apparently he skipped a year or two of high school? Of course. Plot convenience. Marnie gets the nicest fucking room for a college. Seriously, what college has already made up rooms like this? And is surprised by a cameo call from Aggie. It's actually the first time we see Aggie defending Gwen to Marnie. You know, your mother's on your side. Try to cut her some slack. Huh. There's no time. Yeah, Debbie Reynolds is getting paid by the minute, guys. So, enjoy that one scene with Debbie Reynolds, guys. It's the only other time she's in the movie.
Gwen is suffering from empty nest syndrome, and yes, this will be a reoccurring thing in the movie. I'd say a reoccurring joke, but none of it is funny. Marnie meets her RA, a genie named Anissa, who tells her about the Sinister Sisters. They rule the school. Anissa tells her that the Sinister Sisters rule the school, and that students use magic when they can to impress them, though they have to be careful to keep it away from the eyes of the teachers. Marty runs into Ethan. You know, that kid from the previous movie whose dad was the bad guy? Yeah. Marty feels a bit awkward around him because of it, but he explains to her that it's all okay now. I mean, it must be really difficult dealing with your father's exile. Yeah, but your grandma's been great, though. I actually worked for her over the summer, helping her collect her gnarlier potion ingredients because, you know, that would have made for an interesting character dynamic, but of course it's not there anymore. Ethan and Anissa give us more exposition about Witch University. Apparently it used to be open to witches only, hence the name, but since Marty opened the portal between worlds permanently, student enrollment dropped, so the university opened up to include all residents of Halloween Town the previous year. This also explains the no magic rule. It's supposedly to keep things fair, but with people still using it when teachers aren't looking, it's kind of irrelevant. Occasionally, the movie cuts back to Gwen, who has decided to get a job as a real estate agent to help her deal with all her kids being out of the house. Have to wonder how she afforded stuff before. It's painful to watch, honestly. I really love the actress, and yes guys, I know she was April in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you don't have to keep telling me, but man, these scenes drag. I gotta go, Mom. I miss you! <sighs> uh, the birdies. They've all... flown away. It's like the movie was going, well, the actress is available, let's give her something to do, even though it's pointless. So, I'm just mentioning it here, but we aren't gonna discuss the rest of her scenes, because they are the worst. Ugh. Oh, Debbie Reynolds is back! Oh, wait, it's her stunt double. Well, thus begins the montage of meeting the random professors of the school. Marty sits with Ethan in her next class, which apparently pisses off Sinister Sister number one. Whatever. Oh, hey, that guy from before. Guess he was important. You will address me as Sir or Dr. Grog. Not Grog, Dr. G, G-Dog, or G-Unit. Well, G-Unit tells the class that they need to write a one-page paper on the history of the mortal and magic worlds. Really? How would you even do that? Sinister Sister Number 1, of course, uses magic to complete the paper, and she even hexes Marnie so it disappears when she tries to hand it in. Professor Snape over here tells us he's going to be investigating it, and reprimands her for having a hexed paper. Jeez, what a jerk! Marnie and Ethan have a cute romantic moment in the hall, but she gets called to the principal. I mean, Chancellor's office. She informs Marty that all spells cast at Witch University become permanent at midnight on Halloween, which totally won't be important later. Goodwin takes Marty to the castle dungeons, where her and a group of specially selected students, i.e. plot-relevant characters, to participate in a special class. You will spend this semester unearthing the treasures of a millennium of Halloween Town history buried beneath this castle. Ah, yes, the Holes version of learning really did well for that last Disney Channel star. Three quarters of your grade will be based on your personal discoveries here. Just do it! Dr. Ichabod Grog. The fossil himself. The Helix fossil here informs us that the university was built on the grounds of Marnie's old family home. Cromwell Castle. <gasps> Wait, what? Gee, I wonder if that glowing thing will be important. Marnie apparently summons a magic box, but then it immediately cuts to the next scene. I guess it's not important. It just came to me like it wanted to be with me. Like it belonged to me. Well, it did say Cromwell on it, dimwit. And now, a reading of the prophecy. And now, a reading from the Book of Exposition. Praise be unto the plot. High Priest Sinister reiterates the prophecy from the beginning of the movie, with a couple more added lines about Marnie using something called the gift. Chancellor Goodwin comes in and says that Marnie found the box that contains the gift, and Mr. Yelzalot says that only a Cromwell can open it. Well, it's nice to see that everyone in the movie is a bad guy. No need for subtlety. And it seems Sinister always has his voice set to booming megaphone. The one we have waited for. Soon. Girls. 
movie is doing its best to try to establish Marnie as a goody-goody, as explained by Sisters 2 and 3, which is really weird. I guess the whole point of the beginning was to show that Marnie is doomed to give in and use magic eventually? Eh, it's pretty lame, guys. Marnie goes to do her laundry, and after talking to Gwen briefly, Ethan walks in and asks her out. Go get a cup of coffee with me? Mm, I was just accused of using magic when I didn't. I'm not about to be accused of using magic when I did. I have no idea what you just said, but uh, you looked really cute saying it. Well, it seems we've graduated from, hi, I'm the little worst, want to go out, to, I wasn't listening to anything you said, but boy, you're hot. I'm not sure which is worse. Once again, a call from the Chancellor causes Marnie to ditch Ethan. Oh, sure, you kept that character trait from a previous movie. And she asks Marnie to try and open the box. She gives her permission to use magic to try and open it. I'm actually kind of amazed they follow an actual logical progression here. There was no padding out bullshit, they just went straight to having her try and open it. And since the Chancellor gave her permission, it doesn't come across as breaking a rule. Oh wow, that's one positive thing I've said about the movie thus far. Good for you, movie! Now, keep going. Of course it doesn't work, well, we are only in the first half of the movie. So after class, Marnie goes to Professor Periwinkle, the one professor who isn't a member of the evil church choir, and asks her about S. Cromwell, the name of the person on the magic plot device box. What is it you kids say these days? Not gonna let the man keep me down? I wonder if she's friends with Professor G Unit. You remind me of someone I really miss right now. Well, she basically is the stand-in for Debbie Reynolds in this movie, so yeah. Professor Periwinkle tells her that the S stands for Splendora. You're not about to tell me Splendora is you, are you? Because I'm having a very strange Star Wars moment. Wait a minute, Spider-Man? Star Wars? This movie predicted everything! The signs were there! We should have known! The sign was right. Remember, reality is an illusion, the universe is a hologram. Bye, Gold! Bye! Periwinkle tells her that she knew Splendora in the early days of Halloween Town, but promised to keep her identity a secret. I can keep a secret? No, it's too soon. You're simply not ready. Yeah, you're not ready. It's not the final third of the movie yet. Marnie finds Dylan and they go to the library to try and research their family history. History of the Cromwells? Little Cromwell women? Cromwell's Inferno? To kill a Cromwell, Warren Cromwell, Slaughterhouse Cromwell. We find out that Dylan does use magic, but only to be a nerd! I use magic to speed read, okay? Not here, but in high school. No wonder you skipped a grade. Huh. Guess that does explain why he's here. Points to you, movie. Dylan uses his nerd magic to speed read through all the books in the library. I know kung fu. I know it's in the box. What? What's in the box? What's in the box? Oh, come on. How could I not use that? A thousand years ago, Splendora Cromwell locked the gift inside that box and buried it. And? And nothing. That's all I know. After spying on Marnie, the evil church choir decides Dylan needs to be used in order to make her open the box. How's the studying going? I wasn't studying, I was doodling. Popular class doodling. Yes, it's very difficult. Dexterity and all that. Maybe it's just me, but I'm definitely getting some Gilmore Girls vibes here when it comes to a lot of the dialogue. Maybe Sarah Paxton was given that as a direction? She meets up with Ethan, who surprises her with a broom, and they decide to take a flight off campus. So yeah, at this point, you might be wondering, why the heck is Ethan the love interest in this movie? Him and Marnie hardly shared any dialogue in the previous one, none of it even hinting at romance. Well, basically, after Halloween Town High, he was in High School Musical. So of course, Disney would consider him much more marketable now. You know how I know this? He gets top billing in the trailer for the movie! Presenting Return to Halloween Town, a Disney Channel original movie, featuring High School Musical's Lucas Grabiel, Sarah Paxton, and J. Paul Zimmerman. <sighs> Now, I'm not saying he's bad, he does a fine job, it's just... Man, does that romance come out of nowhere? Once they start hanging out more, it makes more sense and develops well, but the initial setup is just... odd. Well, it seems Marnie is three for three when it comes to taking a love interest on a broom ride. Seems like a rite of passage these days. Oh, the music is set to Radio Disney. Ugh. Green screen, no. Ethan takes Marnie to the Snow Miser's ice cream shop? I'm 
Mr. White Christmas. I'm Mr. Snow. Hmm. Bit of an upgrade from the abominable snowman's from the first movie. Nice. Unfortunately, she spots the Sinister Sisters dragging Dylan along, clearly using him to do their homework. Marnie goes over to stop them. Get away from my brother. No, no. I did not edit that in, folks. The movie chose to use that cat screech. It's made clear that Dylan isn't completely under a spell, but still is being somewhat controlled, and Marnie chases after him when he leaves with the sisters. How could they disappear that fast? Uh, magic! Hello? Marnie and Ethan jump on the broom again, but it's jinxed and tosses them off. Miraculously, they have no broken bones, and Ethan actually gets some decent dialogue for once. We just crash-landed on a broom that grew a forked tongue. How can you be so calm? Having a near-death experience is strangely comforting. <laughs> Anissa talks to Ethan the next day, and once again, us as the audience is informed of more rules added to the Halloween Town universe. Apparently, the one power witches and warlocks don't have is complete control over someone. Anissa questions how the Sinister Sisters are able to control Dylan, but Ethan tells them they are merely amplifying his own wishes. The evil council pressures the sisters to make their magic more obvious to make Marnie be tempted to use her own. We're trying. Seriously. Then we need to try harder. Seriously. The teachers show her the page of a prophecy, now with more glitter after effects. They tell her she's the chosen one and will bring peace to the world if she can fulfill the prophecy and use the gift. There are dark forces at work in Halloween Town. Totally not us. My name's Goodwin, remember? Again, the movie is actually progressing rather logically. Nice. Ethan overhears this and goes to the gargoyles out front to tempt information out of them with cheeseburgers. As you do. Hmm. I wonder if Elisa ever knew that about Goliath. After Marnie and Ethan find Dylan is way too over his head with doing homework for the Sinister Sisters, Gwen calls to find out how they're doing. Are you okay? Everything's going to be fine, Mom. Going to be fine. What is going to be? We're fine, Mom. Mom, stop trying to be in the movie! All your scenes are boring! When Marty asks Ethan for help, he tells her he can't, and that the teachers are just using her. Apparently, Ethan's dad was a member of the Evil Secret Council, which is called the Dominion, by the way, and they want to take over Halloween Town and make slaves out of all the other creatures. Apparently, the council members are all witches and warlocks. Of course, Marnie can't see that Ethan is in the right here, as is standard for a Cromwell, they're very good at trusting the wrong people. Donning Aggie's red cloak, Marnie goes to Professor Periwinkle and asks her to help her travel back in time to talk to Splendora. About this ancient prophecy and this silver box and dark forces. And the future of Halloween Town. Yes. Oh, then you are ready. Then why didn't she just tell her this before? You know, before the Dominion got to her? Nice to see the time travel spell looks exactly the same as the world travel spell. You can tell we're in the past when we hear that folklore music in the background. Okay, right place. Benny, who in the previous movies wore a confederate uniform, so I guess we're retconning his story, shows up. Can you give me a ride? Do I seem like some sort of taxi service to you? How do you know what that is? Benny takes her to Cromwell Castle, where this Ren Fair looking place is supposed to be Halloween Town. Uh -huh. She runs into a younger version of Professor Periwinkle. <laughs> Name's Persimmon, miss. Ugh, Persimmon? Tells her that Splendora is soon to be Queen of Halloween Town and speak the devil. <laughs> Kalisi! It is known! Before Marnie can talk to Splendora, she gets stuck in some magic plastic wrap and is thrown in a dungeon. Periwinkle tells her that Splendora is in her room and helps her teleport to it. She finds the box, but there's nothing inside. Slow mo for dramatic effect. Splendora shows up and. Ah, I'm sorry! I just can't take her seriously! I mean, look at her face! It just says, man, this wig really itches. I mean, it must be hard to try and talk to yourself while in bad cosplay, but. Wow! Splendora tells Marnie that the gift is the amulet she's wearing, which allows her to have complete control over someone's will. She doesn't want it, though, saying that the Dominion wants to try and use it for evil. Also, we get this gem. Was your father Merlin? No, Marvin, Merlin's cousin. Ha. Ah. Splendora shows off her control powers to show Marnie just how easy it is for someone to be tempted by it. It cannot be destroyed, at least not on her own. Apparently, you need three Cromwells to destroy it. Splendora's servant really is getting irritated with Splendora's lateness for her coronation, and she does her best mom voice by yelling her full name. Splendora Agatha Cromwell! 
Did she just say Agatha? Tis my middle name. When all this is over, I will become just plain Aggie Cromwell. Wait, Aggie is Splendora? That's the plot twist? Ugh, that's the most cliche thing ever! Come on! She locks the magic stone in the box and sends the key into the future with Marnie, who of course has magically timed herself to just a few hours before Halloween. Plot can mean through time travel, at least that part is consistent. Marnie opens the box but then immediately has the gift taken from her by Goodwin, who plans to make her use it on Halloween night to complete the Dominion's evil plan. Goodwin uses Dylan as a means of keeping Marnie in line, and we find out through Ethan that Brother Dearest is at a Witches and Warlocks only party held by the Sinister Sisters, being abused as usual. Man, don't ever ask the Sinister Sisters to play Mario Kart with you. The sisters turn Dylan into a dog, and Marnie chases after him. Oh hey, a vampire blood drive. Only to lose him, and she calls Gwen for help. After a cliche mother-daughter moment, Gwen gets down to business to make things right. All of this, the, the nice dorm room, the scholarship? How could I have been so stupid? You are not stupid, Marnie. You are 18. That's probably the most profound yet sensible thing to ever come out of a Disney Channel movie. Marnie tries using her witch's glass, which is totally just a laptop, to find Dylan, but gets transported to the evil council's lair. The bad guys lay out their plan, but I keep getting distracted by this dude's amazing James Earl Jones voice. He really should do audiobooks if he hasn't already. You make things sound so... Sinister, Marnie. The Dominion wants Marnie to use the gift to make the Dominion rulers of Halloween Town, since, as we learned earlier, spells cast at which you become permanent at midnight on Halloween. Marnie seems to go along with their plan, but she sets her own plan in motion at the same time. Beam me up, Jeannie. Well, with the track record, Disney very well could be buying that next. As midnight approaches, the relevant cast gathers in the courtyard for the climactic final moments. Marnie makes the bad guys turn Dylan back into a human again, effectively removing the last incentive she has to do anything they want her to. Goodwin makes one last show of tempting Marnie to play her role in the scheme, then puts the necklace on her. So, of course, Marnie, through a series of kind of unnecessary steps, causes Anissa to take the necklace from her and through the combined power of Marnie, Gwen, and Dylan's magic, destroys the gift. The Dominion runs like the cowards they are, but they are stopped by Professor Periwinkle. Persimmon Periwinkle, Agent Periwinkle, of the Halloween Town Anti-Dominion League. Ah, yes, a member of the Anti-You Guys League. I think the first sign that you've been doing an okay job as a villain is if someone makes a league against you. Professor Periwinkle sends the bad guys to whatever magical phantom zone that Ethan's dad is in, and the day is saved. Ethan tells Marnie that the reason he couldn't help her earlier is that he's mortal now. After his dad's powers were taken away, he renounced his. Huh. Wow, that's actually rather mature for this character. Hmm. He's mortal now. Oh, I knew there was something I liked about that kid. Of course, Gwen approves of him because he's mortal now. Ethan tells the Sinister Sisters that they need to apologize to Dylan, and we find out that their magic has been taken away. We're mortal, Dumbbell. We might as well be ugly. She needs to sort out her priorities. We find out from a conversation between Dylan and Gwen that Marty didn't actually destroy the stone, but instead hid it away in one of Dylan's books. Because that seems totally safe. And the movie ends there. Expecting another sequel? I'm rather perplexed by this. I don't get it. So that was Return to Halloween Town, and what did I think of it? Well, to be honest, I actually kind of prefer this to the third movie. <laughs> Yay! Okay, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me explain. Halloween Town High, while it did have Kimberly J. Brown in it, was a much duller movie. Or, well, I guess you could say it was a safe movie. It didn't really do much. It introduces nothing new to the history of Halloween Town, and overall was just kind of meh. This movie? Well, it actually does try in a lot of places. It brings us to Halloween Town, albeit a new location that we spend 99% of our time at, but we see monsters and other creatures of Halloween Town. There are a lot of cringeworthy moments in this movie, but I was never bored by it. I'd rather have a movie like this, which is kind of a so bad it's entertaining movie, versus one that's just kind of a shrug. It definitely had a lot of the Halloween Town flair that the previous movie was missing, mostly because the last one had no Halloween Town in it! And while there are a lot of cliche moments in this, it does have some good or at least entertaining moments sprinkled throughout. I mean, come on, Agent Periwinkle? Where the movie falls a bit flat is its protagonist. I feel really bad for Sarah Paxton. A lot of the writing in this movie is terrible. It makes Marnie come across as just another petty teenager. 
Seriously, it feels like the writers were trying to do a Gilmore Girls kind of thing here and just couldn't pull it off. And Marnie is by no means a saint in the previous movies, but for lack of a better word, this version kind of comes across as bitchy at times. Her constant ugh face kind of doesn't help either. It's really kind of hard to try and picture the Marnie from the previous movies in this incarnation, and we'll never really know why she was recast in the first place. The plot is... clunky. It relies on cliches and plot devices to get everything in order, and again, the previous movies had these at times, but they never felt like they completely dominated the story. It blends elements from all the other movies, a corrupt authority figure, time travel, and an evil secret society, making this kind of the greatest hits of Halloween Town in terms of plot. Then, of course, the Chosen One plot is there, which is so overdone and really doesn't do much. It's so contrived and a waste of time. This movie is a really good example of what can happen if you don't follow the old rule of show, don't tell. And don't get me started on all those comedy scenes with Gwen. They are so bad, I'm not even going to get into it. Now, it's not all bad. There are some pretty decent characters in this. Anissa is a fun, cute character who adds a little bit of personality to the story. You really want to have a friend like her. The Sinister Sisters are generic mean girl knockoffs who you can tell are having a lot of fun being the bad guys. And Ethan actually isn't that bad of a romantic interest for Marnie. I think they could have done a lot more with him. They do try to show in the beginning that Marnie feels awkward around him due to what happened to his dad, but I think that could have been addressed a little more. Ethan pretty much likes Marnie right from the start, which is really weird since, again, he showed no interest in her in the previous movie. It would have been a much stronger romance story if they were both awkward around each other and slowly began to show interest over the course of the movie. Hell, if he had been antagonistic to her and then they slowly became interested, that would have worked too. Oh well. And with that, this is the end of the Halloween Town series. You know, it's not a bad way to end it, although the last 30 seconds of this movie are a bit... perplexing, to say the least. We've been following Marnie's progression as a witch, her initiation into the world of Halloween Town, her finding a balance between her mortal side and her witch side, and finally her learning to become more of an adult and learning more about the world. It's not a bad end to the series, it's kind of cool that we got to see her at a college with the other Halloween Town residents, but the Chosen One plotline was really unnecessary. The only good thing, I guess, is that it helped to up the stakes a bit and made it a bit easier to accept it as the conclusion to the Halloween Town series. So, yeah, although this movie is a bit clunky and can be very cliche at times, there is a lot about it that I actually enjoyed. You know, that actually wasn't as bad as I thought. That's a bit of a surprise. Oh, must be time already. Looks like the trick-or-treaters are here. Well, this has been one very interesting trip down Nostalgia Lane. Thanks, guys, for tuning in to Halloween Town Month. It's been, well entertaining if nothing else. All right, I hope you guys have a great Halloween. Bye guys. Okay, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. The monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. He did the mash. It caught on and flag. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. From my laboratory in the castle east to the master bedroom. Geek Vision